Hello everybody, welcome back to Weekly Wildlife Wisdom. So far I've been your host, Zero Yeti, and this is yet another extinct animal special. So let's go right into it. The first animal of the week being Parasaurolophus, which is a genus of herbivorous hadrosaur and dinosaur that lived throughout as what is now Canada, the United States, and possibly China during the late Cretaceous period, some 77 to 72 million years ago. The first remains of Parasaurolophus, consisting of a skull and partial skeleton, was uncovered by a field party from the University of Toronto in 19. 19- along the Red Deer River in Alberta, Canada. Professor William Parks would later name the animal Parasaurolophus walkerini from the Greek para, meaning near, saurus, meaning lizard, and lophus, meaning crest, with the species name in honor of Sir Brian Edmund Walker, the chairman of the board of the Royal Ontario Museum. Since then, additional remains have been recovered from Alberta, Utah, and New Mexico, with three current species being recognized as valid, those being P. Walkerini, P. Tubinson, and P. Cirrochristatus. A study published in 2014 by Dr. Zing uh, found the Chinese hadrosaur Caronosaurus jayanensis that was actually nested deeply within Parasaurolophus, which created the new species. P. jasonensis, jayensis. Uh, if this species is indeed a Parasaurolophus, then the genus uh, lasts until the KPG mass extinction event and is known from two continents. Reaching upwards of 30 feet in length and uh, weighing approximately 2.5 tons, Parasaurolophus was a fairly robust hadrosaur and sported shortened but heavily built forearms, indicating that it probably referred to forage and walk around on all four legs, but primarily ran on its back too when it needed to go for a speed boost. The most notable feature is the cranial crest, which protruded from the rear of the head and was made up of the premaxilla and nasal bones. The crest was hollow with distinct tubes leading from each nostril to the end of the crest before reversing direction heading back down the crest into the skull. The exact purpose of the crest has long been the subject of speculation and debate, but it is now believed that the primarily serve the functions as a visual display for identifying species and sex, for sound amplification for communication, and for thermal regulation. In life, Parasaurolophus would have lived in medium-sized herds, feeding on a variety of vegetation at different heights, from low down near the ground and reaching up into the lower tree canopy. It preferred to live in wetlands, swamps, and coastal woodlands along the side Ceratopsids, Ankylosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs, Ornithomimids, Troodontids, and other hadrosaurs, being preyed upon by Tyrannosaurs and large crocodilomorphs. Next up, we have Meolania, also known as the horned turtle or horned tortoise. It is an extinct genus of Meolaniid stem turtle that lived throughout Australia, Lord Howe Island, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, and Fiji from the Middle Miocene to Early Holocene, some 20 million years ago to 2,000 years ago. The first remains of Meolania were uncovered on Lord Howe Island by Sir Richard Owen in 1886, who thought they represented ancient lizards and assigned the remains as belonging to two species, being P. platyceps and P. minor, and P. minor is now considered a synonym of the former P. platyceps. He also dubbed the genus Meolania, meaning small roamer. In time, however, it was recognized that Meolania was actually a terrestrial turtle, and today three species are recognized, P. platyceps, P. machiae, and P. brevocolis. Excuse me reaching 4 to 8 feet in length and 200 to 1,000 pounds in weight. Meolania is a candidate for the largest known terrestrial turtle slash tortoise, rivaled only by Megalochelis atlas from Pleistocene Asia. Meolania had an unusually shaped skull that sported many knob-like, horn-like protrusions, two large horns faced sideways, and would have prevented the animal from fully withdrawing its head into its shell. Alongside the large spikes on the head, Meolania also had a spiked tail similar to some tails of ankylosaurs and glyptodonts. These may have been a defensive uh, feature for protecting the head and tail extremities from predators, and such adaptations would have made it difficult for predators to close their mouths around these spots without getting a handful of spikes, well, mouthful of spikes. In life, Meolania would have inhabited forests, savannas, and wetlands, feeding upon sedges, grasses, shrubs, flowers, cacti, fruit, and carrion. 
Uh, the disappearance of much of the Pleistocene megafauna is often attributed to the arrival of humans, and in the case of Melania, is that there is actually direct evidence to support this. In Vatnatu, uh, the remains of Melania have been found in rubbish dumps of early human settlements, and the, we have evidence that they went extinct some 300 years after the first human contact. Next up is Dunkleosteus, which is an extinct genus of large armored jawed placoderm fish that swam the seas of what is now North America, Europe, and Africa during the late Devonian period, around 382 to 358 million years ago. The first remains of the type species D. Torelli were unearthed by J. Torell in 1873, who gifted the specimen to Dr. John Strong Newberry, who formally named and described the animal as a species of Dean Ichthys. In 1956, the specimen, along with several others, were carefully examined and determined to belong to their own genus, Dunkleosteus, named in honor of David Dunkel, the former curator of paleontology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Currently, there are nine species of Dunkleosteus recognized as being D. Torelli, D. Belgians, uh, Belgicus, D. Donisoni, D. Marsaurus, D. Magnificus, D. Missouriensis, D. Newberry, D. Amblyodoratus, D. and D. Riveri. With the largest species reaching upwards of 28 feet in length and 4 tons in weight, Dunkleosis is one of the largest placoderms to ever existed. Like other placoderms, Dunkleosis had a two-part bony armored exterior, which was made, which made a relatively slow but powerful swimmer. Instead of teeth, Dunkleosis possessed two pairs of sharp bony blade-like plates, which formed a beak-like structure with which Dunkleosis could concentrate a force of up to 8,000 pounds per square inch on the tip of its mouth, allowing the animal to slice through flesh, snap bone, and crush armor. Dunkleosteus could also open its mouth in one fifteenth of a second, which would have caused a powerful suction that pulled prey into the mouth, a food capture technique reinvented by many other Tilios fishes today. Dunkleosteus may have also been one of the first animals with internalized egg fertilization, and thus sexually reproduce in a manner similar to many modern fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Although placoderms only existed for around 50 million years, their mark on the fossil record is quite visible when they were a pioneer in the later stages of the Paleozoic and vital to the success of vertebrates. Next up we have the southern gastric brooding frog, also commonly referred to as the platypus frog, and is an extinct species of frog in the family Myobacteriidae which was native to the rainforest and sclesteral forests of Greenlands, Australia. This species and its close relative, the also now extinct northern gastric brooding frog, uh, made up the genus Rhinobactrus, and first scientifically described in 1973, the southern gastric brooding frog was a medium-sized amphibian with large protruding eyes positioned close to together on a short, with a short blunt snout. The arms and legs were large in comparison to the body, with only the rear feet being webbed. Females are larger than males at around 1.7 to 2.2 inches in length, compared to males at 1.2 to 1.6 inches. It was a dull gray to slate black colored frog that had small patches, both lighter and darker than the background coloration, scattered over the dorsal surface. There was also a dark stripe that ran from the eye to the base of the forelimb and the belly was white with large patches of cream or pale yellow coloration. They were predominantly an aquatic species that could be found in and around permanent streams, rivers, and rock pools, preferring to hide amongst leaf litter or underneath rocks feeding upon various arthropods, generally only fully revealing themselves to sit upon rocks during light rain. What makes the two species of gastric, oh well, brooding frog unique amongst all frog species is their form of parental care. Following external fertilization by the male, the female would take the eggs or em and embryos into her mouth and swallow them. The jelly around each of the eggs was made of a substance called prostaglidin E2, or PGE2. Uh, this could turn off the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach, and this source of PGE2 was enough to cease the production of acid during the embryonic stages of the development of the eggs. When the eggs had hatched, the mucus extruded from the tadpole's gills contained enough PGE2 necessary to keep the stomach in a non-functional state. During the six-week long gestation period, the mother would not eat, but would remain active, assisting off of fat reserves. 
Uh, then over the course of a week, the mother would vomit up to 26 of the now live, fully formed frogs. Unfortunately, human introduction of the pathogenic fungi to, native, to their native ranges quickly decimated both species of gastric brooding frog, with the last known southern gastric brooding frog going extinct in 1983 and the last known northern gastric brooding frog following shortly after in 1984. Fortunately, scientists at the University of Newcastle and the University of New South Wales have begun a cloning project referred to as the Lazarus Project in 2013 to try and resurrect the southern species. Embryos have been successfully cloned and the project eventually hopes to produce a living frog in the near future. Next up is Camptosaurus, which is a genus of plant-eating beaked Ornithischian dinosaur which lived during the late Jurassic period throughout western North America some 161 to 145 million years ago. The first remains of Camptosaurus were unearthed by William Hallow Reed in 1879 with within Albany County, Wyoming. Reed presented the find to Orsdale Charles Marsh, who described and named the specimen Camptotonus uh, dispar, or flexible back in Greek. The genus was renamed Camptosaurus by him in 1885 because the name Camptonotus was already in use for a cricket. For a time, Camptosaurus was used sort of as a wastebasket taxon for any incomplete medium-sized ornithopod with many of these specimens, especially the African and European examples, later being reclassified as different genera. Today, it is generally considered the only type species Camptosaurus dispar is valid. However, there is a matter of debate as to whether or not the closely related Uteodon and Comnoria are in fact Camptosaurus species. Reaching upwards of 6 feet tall at the hips, 26 feet in length, and uh, 1,500 to 2,500 pounds in weight, Camptosaurus is a relatively heavily built animal with robust hind limbs and four-toed broad feet, allowing the animal to reach speeds of upwards of 15 miles an hour. The skull is triangular with a pointed snout, the jaws filled with densely packed teeth and equipped with a beak. In life, Camptosaurus would have lived in loose herds traveling throughout the semi-arid shrublands, dry and riverine woodlands, and formed prairies of the Morrison Formation, alongside other Ornithischians such as Dryosaurus, Gargoyleosaurus, and Stegosaurus, theropods such as Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, Torvosaurus, and sauropods such as Camarasaurus, Barosaurus, and Apatosaurus. Wear patterns on Camptosaurus' teeth indicate that it ate tougher and grittier plants than the other herbivores, possibly as a form of niche partitioning. Next up is Palomoscorpus, which is an extinct genus of scorpion that lived throughout West Day Europe during the Visian and Skurpokovian ages of the Carboniferous period, around 336 to 326 million years ago. The first remains of Palomoscorpus were uncovered from the East Kirkland Quarry uh, in the West Lothian region of Scotland by Dr. Jerem in 1994 who named the animal Paloma scorpius kirktonensis, from the Latin palomas meaning lung, and the Greek scorpios meaning scorpion. Reaching up to 20 inches, 28 inches in length, Paloma scorpius was characterized by the presence of a long spur on each of the apophysis on the first leg pair, as well as the elongated sternum and the Y-shaped sculculus. Unlike modern scorpions, but similar to other basal counterparts, Plumus scorpius possessed a pair of anterior positioned medium eyes and a pair of lateral eyes that were, had remarkably good vision for an arachnid. Because of this uh, and its size and venom, Plumus scorpius was likely one of the apex terrestrial predators of its coal swamp home, feeding upon other large arthropods and possibly amphibians and early reptiles. It is impossible to say how toxic the venom of Paloma scorpius would have been, but a good rule of thumb is that the smaller the pincers in relation to the thickness of the tail, the more potent the venom, and the thicker tails holding large amounts of venom. And due to Paloma scorpius' relatively small pincers, it's likely it hunted by ambushing its prey before delivering a lethal sting. And our, extinct, our extant animal of the week is the beluga whale, also known as the white whale, the sea canary, or the melon head, or simply the beluga. It is a species of arctic and subarctic dwelling cetacean and is only a member of its genus Delphinopterus, along with the, and along with the narwhal it makes up the family Motodontidae. The beluga is a small stocky whale adapted to life in the arctic, growing up to 18 feet long and weighing up to 
3,600 pounds, it sports many anatomical and physiological characteristics that differentiate from other cetaceans. Amongst these are its all white color and absence of a dorsal fin, which allows it to swim under ice with ease. It possesses a distinctive protuberance on the front of its head, which houses an echolocation organ called the melon. This along in this within this species, its large and deformable melon uh, gives it a broad range of sense of hearing and a highly developed in its echolocation allows it to move about, hunt hunt prey and find breathing holes under the sheet ice. A gregarious and social species, belugas typically travel in pods of around 10 animals, although during summer they can gather in hundreds or even thousands within estuaries and coastal areas. They are also known to regularly befriend and travel with both narwhals and bowhead whales. They are slow swimmers, but can dive up to 2,300 feet below the surface in search of food, such as shrimp, squid, clams, crabs, octopus, sea snails, worms, and various fish species. Belugas are themselves preyed upon by both orcas and polar bears. The mating season typically lasts from February to May, and although this does vary regionally, uh, after a 15 to 16 month gestation period, the mother gives birth to a single calf, typically within a bay or estuary where the water is warm and shallow. The young are dependent on their mothers, nursing up to 20 months until weaned. They remain with and are raised by their birth pod until they reach sexual maturity around 4 to 7 years for females and 7 to 9 years for males. And then they set off to join a different pod. Uh, under ideal conditions, a beluga may live up to 50 years. As always, take care to my guys, gals, non-binary pals.